Okay, gang's all here. Uh, I think I can welcome everyone then to and get started here with the January 4th, 2021, the first meeting of the new year for the Hadley Public Schools School Committee. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Are there any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? No, I don't believe there are. All right. With that, we will move into public comment. I um, believe everybody who is who has a name uh, is in our meeting. So if you would like to make any public comment, please raise your digital hand and we will um, ask you to unmute so that you can make public comment. Uh, Ethan has a hand raised. I'm going to lower. Sorry, I will ask Ethan to unmute. Oops. Ethan? Hi. Would you like to make public comment, Ethan? It's Linda, uh, Ethan's mom, Ethan Label. Um, quick question on the data, if you could address it when you get to that point is, are you considering what Hadley's showing now? I noticed they were in the red. So I was just curious, I know we're going on Hampshire County. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that when you get to that, that's all. Thank you. Um, yes, we will consider both the county data and the local town data as well um, when we discuss that as part of tonight's agenda. Thank you. Okay, um, now we have uh, Emily Pfeiffer. I will ask you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay, thanks. Um, so first, regarding the rainbow crosswalk that was proposed by the GSA at the last meeting, I love it. And I appreciate so much that it was so well supported. And just thank you to this group and the administration for your warm encouragement of that project. And way to go, Kyle and the GSA for pulling it together. That's very cool. It made me really proud. So thanks. Um, okay, so that was the fun part. COVID data. Um, I, I appreciate that the committee has set thresholds and that they were set for good reason and the metrics were put in place really thoughtfully. And I know that they were based on recommendations from trusted sources. I do not think that we could we should be raising those thresholds now just to open schools again while we're in the midst of such high community rates in the town and in the county. Um, it's not the time to send everybody back into the buildings. Community spread increases the risk for everyone. Annie said it really well in the last meeting. Um, experts have been clear about this. Community transmission brings it into schools. It doesn't mean that it's the school that's responsible for the spread initially, right? But it raises the risk for everybody. Uh, and I feel like the idea of raising the thresholds just to bring people back is just another move toward waiting until we see evidence of it, right? It's like, it's the yet, I keep hearing the yet at the end of these statements. We haven't seen school spread yet. We should be doing what we can do to prevent it, not just waiting for it to happen. So. Um, I know there are really valid concerns about having students at home. I would hope that we would look for ways to reach out and better support students if we're concerned about their well-being at home. I understand there are lots and lots of challenges with remote learning, but I just don't think sending everyone back into the buildings is the only option. Um, I, we also have to look at the ways that we're testing in Massachusetts. Some authorities are suggesting our numbers are higher than they appear because of how we're testing historically. So there was advice, and I don't remember if it was the DPH or the CDC, recommending that metrics should be under thresholds for multiple weeks before moving back to in-person. And I know right now we're looking at it mostly weekly. I saw, um, Annie, I saw your schedule that was um, for the most part week by week. Uh, but uh, Tara made the really good point last time. Um, I feel like if it, if it just kind of squeaks under, if it's just under three, I feel like giving it a second week before deciding it's safe enough, I'm making air quotes safe enough to send them back would just give a more accurate view. Maybe it comes down further if it's on the cusp, maybe it bounces back up. But that way, you know, in, in two week chunks, maybe it just gives the opportunity to confirm that it's clear enough to send them back in. Um, so lastly, I just, this is just a lot to ask. All of this is a lot to ask of the committee and of the administration and the faculty and the staff. And I'm sorry that you're in the positions that you are with these crazy heavy decisions and responsibilities, but I just wanted to thank you for everything that you're doing throughout all this. That's all, thanks. Thanks, Emily, much appreciated. Um, and we'll be sure to consider that as we move ahead with the discussion around the data and the metrics. 
Okay, next, uh, Cassie Stewart will ask you to unmute. Cassie? Hi. Um, I just wanted to kind of add a little bit to what Emily said about having a two week period to look at. Um, as an educator and as a parent, having just a couple of days to try to plan everything out is a lot. It's very tight, um, both for childcare as well as lesson plans, because what teachers are teaching in person is not going to translate to virtual and vice versa. So having a little extra time to plan and get things settled would be really helpful. Okay, thank you very much for that perspective. I appreciate that. Anyone else? We are in public comment right now. If you've just joined us, um, if you would like to make public comment, please raise your digital hand and we'll make sure that we get you unmuted. Okay, seeing um, no additional comments or digital hands raised, then we will move into the presentations and discussion items. And again, I'd just like to thank um, the public for uh, attending our meeting. We've had so much involvement we really do appreciate it. And we appreciate the public comments and your feedback um, and thoughts that you share with us as we move ahead and consider um, the items in, in all of our meetings. So again, thank you very much. Um, our first presentation and discussion item is the winter athletics when students are remote. Um, Mr. Sudnick, I believe the floor is yours. All right, thank you for once again having me this evening. It's good to see everybody. Um, I, I do have a document that I put together I think will help. I only have a few discussion items, so I'm gonna risk sharing my screen again if that's okay. I think it will be safe. All right, excellent. Um, and again, I'll try and keep it brief. I know you have a lot to get through and a lot of important items to cover. So I'll just, I'm just kind of starting from the, the top and working my way down from statewide to conference to league. All right, as far as um, something they can update people with. So uh, we recently received an MIA update because um, Governor Baker had made some announcements on rollback in certain sectors that would impact athletics across the state. And the MIA went and consulted the MIA and the EA confirmed uh, with the MIA that um, Governor Baker's announcement on that day would not affect the guidelines that had been set in place ahead of time that we had based all of our guidelines on. Uh, so we are okay to move forward with the current guidelines and the current plan that we had set. So they, it was a good clarification piece that they had given to us. Um, so that's the, uh, more of a statewide update. Um, they have not changed any timelines officially for any winter um, athletics at this point. Um, they've left the open window from that December 14th that they initially set till the, the 28th of December, and that's going to be still consistent. As far as our conference, the PBIAC, uh, there was an informal poll that went out recently, and uh, this was out of 25 schools who responded. It was just through kind of an AD email chain. It wasn't an official poll, just something informal for us to be able to gauge how the other school districts were, were acting um, with how their current situation was and what was being done and what schools were doing. So out of 25 schools that had responded to the informal poll, uh, 15 of the schools will be fully remote and continue to do winter athletics. Two schools um, will be remote and have just practices. Five will do athletics um, with the fact that they are hybrid currently, or when they go to hybrid, they will resume athletics. And three have chosen not to have athletics because of various and sundry reasons. So that's, um, again, just an informal poll out of uh, our conference schools, which is more like 60 schools. So it doesn't give you a full perspective, but um, just some more information for the school committee and the administration to make decisions with. Um, as far as our league update, um, uh, we have we're going to uh, practice and play against or not practice against play against the same teams that we had uh, planned on playing with this fall um, with the addition that we were supposed to 
be playing Smith Academy, but as you can see from my update, that they are going to be doing practice only um, for their school district. Um, schools that are going to be fully remote, um, but they will have full athletics um, as, as of this point will be Greenfield, Turner's, Frontier, Mahar, Pioneer, uh, Franklin Tech, and Athol. So the majority of the schools of which we were scheduled to play against will be full remote and then still have the athletic um, for the winter. Um, Mohawk is waiting for official school committee approval, but in our talks, they had it, it, the athletic director had indicated that there was a good chance that they would be doing winter athletics as well, and we've scheduled for that. So um, in our conference, we've set uh, a basketball schedule. I haven't put it up on the MIA site because waiting for the school committee meeting to make sure we're all set to move forward. Um, so I'll get that up uh, if and when we are fully approved to keep moving forward. And but it consists of nine games and then a three-game kind of tournament at the end um, that we'd be looking forward to getting in. Um, other than that, uh, the guidelines have not changed as far as how we would um, practice in the cohort model and uh, the setup for the gymnasium and um, all the guidelines that we had set in the winter athletics update. Um, yeah, so I guess if there are any questions, that is my update as of this point for the information that I have. So. Thank you, Eric, for that. I do have one quick question, and that is um, as soon as I saw um, the schools that we would be competing against, I went to the weekly dashboard to see how their numbers had been faring as of late. And I noticed that a lot of them aren't in our spreadsheet. I'm wondering, um, are you tracking that? And maybe um, aside from Eric, are you tracking that? Annie, is there a way that we can add those schools? Uh, maybe it's a separate section down below. I'm not sure what qualifies exactly the schools that we are watching, but we should definitely watch the ones that we're playing against. Okay. So can I just clarify, Eric, what you might be looking for, Kumara? I just want to make sure I understand. I can certainly, so when we look at the dashboard, the dashboard of towns, that first part doesn't have lists of schools. The second one has the cases in schools, staff and students, that's what you're talking about. And you're suggesting to add those schools that are in the conference to that. List. Yeah, of, of all the schools um, that are in our conference, uh, Greenfield, Turner's, Frontier, Mayhar, Pioneer, Franklin Tech, Athol, Mohawk, and Smith Academy, I believe, I I'm only seeing Frontier. Frontier, you're saying Frontier, Athol, Smith Academy, because the reason the schools, you're looking at Hampshire County schools and the only outliers were if they had high school students who were mixing, but I'm happy to add the, the schools that are in the conference as well and just color code that accordingly. Yes. So right now it's no color coding means you're just a district in Hampshire County. Um, and then some color coding indicates that uh, you may be having high school students follow a regular schedule in person. That's why I'd added them, but I'm happy to add these and I'll just color code it and let people know what it represents. Great, thank you. Great idea, Himera. Um, thanks for mentioning that. My, my question for Eric, uh, what's your recommendation? I mean, given your, your position, given the guidelines that are out there, given um, you know, the, the responsibilities that are going to be placed upon all of the staff and coaches, et cetera, um, and where we are now, kind of what, what are your thoughts around, um, I appreciate the research. I'm just looking for kind of given your research and given your discussions um, with others, where, where, where you think this sits. So with everything that's gone on and following how the fall went with all of our precautions and, you know, I know the data has increased, um, you know, as far as the numbers, of, you know, and which is why we're taking the steps we are. Um, at this point, I, I would recommend that we continue to move forward um, and monitor how things are going. Um, we'll still have two weeks of practices um, before we can even participate in the first game. We can use that as a barometer for how things are going. Um, the, the practices are going to be very closely monitored. The students are going to be wearing masks the entire time. So that, you know, that's going to be go a long way to help, um, you know, the restrictions on the mask have, have tightened up as far as we're going to get closer to winter. Um, 
the numbers of student athletes participating, um, I think will allow us to do four separate practices. It looks, it's looking like we will have just varsity and JV level teams, and we can have students from middle school all the way up to high school participate on those teams. Um, and it looks like we would be able to do four separate practice time, which will um, decrease the amount of uh, students that would be on the practice court at one time. Um, so that would be more beneficial, not only for the amount of, you know, time and space for the students, but uh, the lack of interaction between the two teams for the most part. Um, and even at games, uh, they would be separated out in, uh, in the plan that I talked about earlier with the four separate bleachers um, comprised of benching areas for the entire time of which a, a team was there. Um, so the separation would be pretty extensive. Um, I think the students um, in the community are really pining for the winter athletic season. Um, I've had a lot of outreach from community members expressing a lot of support and, and really, you know, being gung ho for the season and how much how students are so passionate, especially around basketball. Um, I think, you know, the state's given out guidelines. Um, they've approved these as safety measures for us to use moving forward, um, and they continue to do so. I think it would I think it'd be worthwhile to move forward with the opportunity to allow the students not only the physical out, you know, physical um, benefits of participating in these activities, but the social benefits as well. Um, we're lucky to have the high rate, uh, top rate coaching staff that we've been able to have the last few years. Um, and uh, I think the impact that they have on these young men and women uh, are tremendous. So I think there are a lot of benefits to moving forward um, as with, with the risks that are out there, um, as long as we continue to follow the guidelines and um, yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. And uh, we did, uh, Mr. Mish had the, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the crew he has coming for the floor, but they did recently come in and redo all the floors. So the floors are top notch. They'll be the best they have ever. Usually we, we redo the floors during the summer. Um, with ever, all the, you know, tumultuousness of the year, we didn't do them during the summer. Um, but the, so it'll be fresh. Um, to maximize the, the least amount of slipping <laughs> for our players. So that that'll be good. Um, but and and that whenever the gym floors are redone, it looks pristine in there. And uh, so that will be awesome experience for the young men and women as well. So. I'll just say, uh, Eric, I think you've done a great job sort of coordinating with your colleagues around town. And, um, you know, I've read through all the MIA guidance. I think there's some smart measures in there. I think, like you said, the couple of weeks of practice would be a good, uh, it'd be good for the, the kids just to get a feel of how to play with masks on and follow the new rules. And so that's a good, gives us a good time to ease into competitions. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive of this approach. I think it's a, it's a smart way to move forward. And as you said, I think the benefits are clearly there. I think you know, this would be a good, good entree into winter and then hopefully spring sports. So I think it's important. I know there's a bunch of schools in the area that have been playing sports all year. I know in the east, uh, eastern part of the state, they've been doing basketball since December 14th in a lot of places. And I haven't heard a, a problem with that. So we're not pioneering anything here. This has been going on for quite a while. So. Uh, I think we can do it smartly, so I support it. Thanks. Thank you. And as I did say, um, most of the schools that we played during the fall um, were fully remote for whatever reasons their school districts had decided and they had done the fall sports. I know the numbers aren't quite the same, um, but they had had success with being remote and having uh, sports or extracurriculars on top of that as well. So. I'm supportive as well, Eric. I appreciate the the background and and information gathering that you've done to help us, and you know, being able to consider all of that. Um, and and so yeah, as before, when we talked earlier in the year, I think it's it's amazing to me how much you know attention has gone into just the finite details of how the sports are played, how the health and safety is at the you know the forefront of all of the the changes to rules and regulations, right? Which are hard for anybody to keep up with, let alone, uh, you know, especially if you're so used to how things have always been. So 
much appreciated. I'm, I'm in support of it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. If I could just add for the school committee, I'll say this on behalf of Ms. Camuso. So one of Ms. Camuso's strengths is that she always thinks about every single student. So when we're talking about athletics, please note that if we, uh, the school committee is supportive of moving forward with athletics, those extracurricular activities, for example, jazz band, if the advisor wanted to move forward following safety precautions, that those students would have the same, uh, they would also have access to their in-person extracurricular activities. Just so you know that that's, you're not just uh, approving <coughs> athletics, but it would include all extracurriculars. Thanks, Annie. That seems very simple. Um, so I'm in support of this as well. And what I had <clears throat> commented before is that Hadley, the, the student athletes that are athletes in, in Hopkins are very passionate. And um, I, I feel strongly that whether or not we have sports being played in our district in particular, they're going to find a way to play those sports. And I would rather have them play um, within our district where we're able to provide a little bit more monitoring and we know what other districts are doing for safety measures um, and mitigation strategies. So um, I, I, I agree with that and I support it. Um, one thing I want us to just think about as we're going forward is um, what we would do in the case of a school-wide transmission and paying attention to the other districts and whether or not they're in a school-wide transmission and what does that mean? You know, are, are other schools taking the same precautions as we are when it comes to a school-wide transmission? I'm not talking about a case here or there. I'm talking about our schools get shut down. I, I do feel that we need to be safe and responsible to our community at that point. Um, and then I would, I would want to know that the other districts are thinking similarly. So all in all, again, I'm in support of it. I just would want to make sure that we're at least paying attention to that aspect of it. Yeah. So I'm going to be in constant communication with the athletic directors from the other school. Um, especially if we had a contest coming up, we would have all the names and all, you know, uh, all contact information for the students ahead of time. So that way, in case there's anything going on, um, or a case of transmission came close contact incident came back, we would have all that information. And uh, my expectation, as well as the expectation for the other athletic directors would be, we are open and communicating with any sort of issues that are going on. So we don't put another district at risk, right? So we're, the communication will be wide open and, and uh, clear and distinct and constant. So, um, you know, it's about the, the health and safety of the students first and foremost. Um, Trying to get them active in the best and most safe way we can so and if um school committee could just be um made aware of any information when i don't i don't mean any constant contact but anytime there's any school co transmission that's concerning if we can just be made aware sure yeah very much so thank you i think that's a good idea tara and i'll just say one thing too eric is um you know, part of my comfort here is uh, a lot of faith in you. I think you're very good at setting and, and maintaining clear expectations. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. And, and our coaching staff, we're very blessed to have um, the staff we do. They don't cut corners. Um, they care as much for the student athletes off the court as they do on the court, honestly. Um, and uh, I, I can say that with no hesitation. Uh, we're we're really lucky to have the staff members we do and who care as much about our student athletes as they do, so. Well, and just to add to what Paul said, I think too, part of our confidence in you, Eric, is also the relationships that you have with the other districts and their athletic directors and their staff in that you've always been very open about sharing what their plans are or if they are challenged um, in certain areas. You know, I trust that you'll, and you know that it's open dialogue here that you can come to us with those discussions. But I think with that addition to Humera, as you suggested in the dashboard, that will help us just to be able to focus, you know, a review in case um, there is attention that needs to be looked at within those districts in terms of any kind of rise in numbers. Excellent. Yeah, we'll keep the lines of communication open. And anytime the school committee feels that we need to adjust our stance, you know, we will do so. So, and I appreciate the opportunity to allow us to try and move forward to make this the best experience for the student athletes that we can. So I thank you once again for, for listening, being open and um, for your input and your questions, so. I um, mentioned this um, 
way back when the sports um, rules came out. Um, it's actually quite uh, unbelievable how different um, the uh, how how much uh, thought and care went into the creation of those uh, of the sports rules and uh, and the team that they put together to look at that and it it, it was shocking to me in comparison to complete opposite when it came to um, guidance as it related to reopening and metrics and and all of that um, so. I, I have much more faith in um, how sports have been thought through. And of course, I um, believe not only in the team, but also you have a track record of doing things well so far um, with sports. Um, so I take part in that. The, other, the only other thing I wanna say I agree with all of my teammates on this um, is that what we've seen with COVID appears to be um, that where there are, unfortunately, where there are households that are uh, that that do not have uh, health and fitness and and uh, you know um, dis many disadvantaged homes. Um, you know, COVID is a disease that has gone after underserved populations in way disproportionate numbers. And a lot of that has to do with um, those kinds of uh, uh, luxuries in a sense, um, athleticism, good food, you know, all, all those things. And I just think that we cannot compromise when it comes to sports and health done safely. Um, so for that reason, um, I think it's really important that we just try really hard to um, stay committed to um, keeping sports safe and open. Thank you. Thanks, Yamara. Ethan, any comments that you wanted to make? I mean, I would just echo what everybody else said. And I, 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 the only thing I'd add is that in, in addition to everything that's been, been said, I think the opportunity for these uh, student athletes to be able to get on the court together and exercise together, play together. is just probably a really good thing for all of these kids who've had to spend you know a lot of time in their homes over the last uh, many months. So this is going to be a great opportunity for them. Thank you very much. So this is not a, a voting or action item here. Um, I think you're hearing, Eric, the support from our committee, and we look forward to hearing how things go. And uh, I think otherwise, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, we're we're good on this topic. Excellent. Now I appreciate the time tonight. I'll be meeting with the coaches later this week. Uh, Zoom meeting with the coaches. Usually it's in person, but we'll do our Zoom meeting and then look forward to start next Monday and uh, hopefully have more students sign up. Numbers are lower, obviously, with everything going on. Um, I just want any and all students and families who are looking for the opportunity to sign up and, and take part and get everybody involved who's ready and willing. So I appreciate it. Thanks for the time tonight. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Yep. Take care, everybody. You too. OK, um, next is review of the public health data. Annie. Yeah. The clock. So here we are. Folks have seen this in the weekly update see here. And um, we can see that Things are uh, things are not looking good, and post the holiday, uh, we, and we're seeing a steady increase. I also added information to this. Um, scroll over. I added information about the number of students who are now everyone's remote, but who are usually in person or learning remotely. And I also added information, our most up-to-date flu vaccine information. Um, so the number of percentages in the district and uh, in each school. The deadline for this has been extended to the last day of February. So we do hope that um, families are able to get their children vaccinated if they haven't already in accordance with 
the requirement from the Department of Public Health, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. This is not a local requirement. This is not determined by the school committee or by the administration. This is a requirement from the state and from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. The thinking being that um, it would just help all of us to stay healthier and uh, minimize the strain on the healthcare system if people aren't also needing to be seen for influenza. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions about the data, if there's anything the school committee wanted to say or comment on. Um, I appreciate you adding in the flu data um, and updating folks through the superintendent newsletter too about the requirement being extended, but encouraging them to um, uh, get that vaccination. And yeah, so I mean, I, I don't have any questions about the data or where we are since we last met. Okay, I will then, um... I will bring folks' attention. I mean, one thing not related to public health data, but if you pay attention to our total enrollment down here, because we are also entering budget season, you can see this is a bit of a problem. We've seen a 3.5% decrease in total enrollment since last year. Ours is not as significant as many other districts around us, but this will potentially have an impact on funding for the town of Hadley in fiscal year 22. I know that there was discussion about um, the school committee has put a considerable amount of thought into how to make a determination about instructional model and what metrics to use. And beginning back in August, there was discussion about the importance of not relying on a single metric. So when we look at something like countywide transmission, we don't just look at one thing, we look at more than one thing that um, the reason some folks have asked, why don't we just pay attention to Hadley when we go into the report, when folks can click on these reports and see the town of Hadley. And that was because Hadley has so few residents and the recommendation is that we want a minimum of per 100,000. And so we looked at Hanford County. Um, also the CDC, so this last tab, remember this is uh, public, so Anyone can see it. Usually the link is included in the superintendent's weekly email. I'll try to make sure it always is included there. So these indicators of risk level for transmission in schools come from the CDC. The school committee also back in August looked obviously at CDC indicators, new cases per 100,000 in the last 14 days. You can see the CDC has a much higher threshold for um, incident per 100,000, but beginning in August, the school committee had given a lot of attention to the Harvard Global Health Institute's key metrics for COVID suppression, which is where um, the school committee chose to set its threshold, which is probably a very logical thing to do. If you remember, um, some folks from the Chan School of Public Health helped us, weighed in on our reentry plan and on these metrics so that but certainly, um, I would argue, a wise decision for the school committee to um, defer to the recommendations of the Harvard Global Health Institute. Um, but the CDC even recommends looking at, this is our average daily incidence rate per 100,000 and the testing positivity rate. These should be our core, core indicators. And also, are we implementing key mitigation strategies? What I started to do with this is uh, you can see the risk level. This, the stated areas here are taken directly from um, the CDC indicators. And then I just started to put together, if we were to fill in the information about each of these indicators, the core indicators, um, as well as some of these secondary indicators, what does each week look like? But some of these indicators aren't in the weekly dashboard, they're in the daily dashboard. And I do want to say the percent change in new cases per 100,000 compared with previous seven days, because the COVID dashboards for DPH give 14 day windows. Really, um, typically this should work. I'm just doing some simple division here, but I wanna thank Ms. Gladstone, math teacher at Hawkins Academy and her husband, a brilliant engineer for helping me work through this. And she was very clear, typically it should work. 
Um, however, uh, sometimes it won't. And that has to do with the line of best fit. She was kind enough to model this out entirely um, in some sort of mind bending calculus spreadsheet she sent me. She's gonna stick with the division and tell you guys it's not always perfect. But this is not this is not to suggest that the school committee is adopting additional metrics. It's to just kind of give the community a, a broader picture of what's going on in terms of uh, risk of transmission based on core indicators and secondary indicators recommended by the CDC, not established by us or made up. And that's all I have on that, unless the school committee has any questions or wanted to have any discussion about any of this. So I think, Annie, just to recap, if we go back to the data, sure. um, we are seeing our thresholds exceeded in multiple areas uh, in terms of uh, case count in the town, um, community percent Sorry. positivity. Okay struggling to get to where I need to go. Heather. That's okay. <laughs> hmm. I think it's um, hit the arrow that's all the way to the right at the there bottom. We go. Yeah, there, there we go. There you go. And there's your dash. the wrong one. There we go. Yep. Yeah, so the red is signifying um, we really actually haven't changed since um, we looked at this last week. Uh, although the week of the 17th, when we looked at it, we were still in the caution area around the town. Um, we've had a uh, representative from the Board of Health uh, describe to us that the cases are not within town are not isolated to, you know, a particular demographic, uh, you know, like a, um, a extended care facility or anything very specific like that, that it was, I think she said at that time, as young as two years old. Um, mm -hmm. So we took caution and uh, did go fully remote that week of the, for the week of the 21st and um, extended that into this week. And so we'll have another set of local and town and community, um, sorry, county data coming out this Thursday evening, correct? Mm -hmm. That we can evaluate yes. and determine and we'll have a, a, an opportunity to talk through on Monday whether there is a, any change in plan. So I wanna clarify the community what, what I, and if I'm mistaken, I just, whatever direction the school committee wants to give me on this. But my understanding is that on Thursday evening that I will look at these data and then I would announce that for the following week. We, we don't, I provide information on Hadley. These are, um, this is Hadley data, total case count and last 14 day case count, the first two columns, and then average daily incidence rate per 100,000 in Hampshire County and testing positivity rate in Hampshire County. If both of these indicators remain red, which is 25 or above for the average daily incidence rate and 3% or above for testing positivity, then um, we would continue remote. Um, we may discuss it on Monday, but we've continued remote and I would make that call on Friday morning. Thursday night, frankly, I would make that call immediately. Is that correct? That, that is what we discussed. I'll just jump in and just um, thank you, Annie, for giving that overview that, of the CDC. That it was helpful to put that in context. I, I'll be honest, the thing that sticks out to me, and, and I'm not saying we need to revisit or reopen these metrics. Um, it, I think it was painful to get here. I'm not sure it's worth revisiting them. I think the, we're at moderate to lower to low risk on almost every category. I know the increased one is in the pink, but everything else, we're at moderate risk. And I think you just have to weigh that against the cost to our children. And I think, April, you're going to talk later on this. There are real costs to our children for being out of school. There's risk to be in school, but we are in the moderate to lower to lowest risk. I think we are being overly conservative at 3%. Lowest risk here is below 5%. We're at three. So I think we can, we can accept more risk, which means more benefit to our kids to be in school. There's a real cost to not being in person. And I do not think we are respecting that sufficiently. I think the risk, the fear of the, the virus is overriding 
the unseen costs for our children. And again, I think April, you'll touch on this in a bit. So I'm not, I mean, we, I don't think I have, frankly, if I thought the rest of you on the school committee would side with me, I would continue to push it. I don't think I'm gonna get any traction with you all, but I, I, I will just go on record that we're being way too conservative given the cost to our children, the real psychological grades, uh, emotional cost to our children. I think we are not respecting that sufficiently. And I don't think that you are all intentionally ignoring that. I just think that it's so unforeseen, but real. Um, and I think this latest increase is significant and we need to respect that. But even that dramatic increase that we've seen, and it's the worst it's ever been, we are not seeing, we're still in that moderate category on almost every aspect. And I will say I touched on, maybe I'll get on to the next category. I've been talking to the UMass testing people and out of, what is it, 530 some odd cases they've had out of 188,000 tests, they have no indication of in-school transmission, zero from all their testing. It's all been outside of school. And if you look at the, the chart that you're keeping any of those 22 other schools, I would argue none or almost zero of those or, or very few of those show any level of in-school transmission. For all those thousands of children that have been doing some sort of hybrid, remote or partial in school, we're just not seeing the in-school transmission. So I, I continue to argue the risk is low to our children. We're being too conservative and they need to be in school as soon as we can safely. Not saying throwing all caution to the wind and just get them in there no matter what. But I think our staff have proven they can maintain safety protocols, keep our children safe, and we can have more children in school. Annie, I have a question for you. If you could go back to the that CDC page. I think there, uh, yep, this is the one. I'm, I'm looking at the last two weeks and I, I'm having a hard time understanding why like row eight and nine don't have items in the yellow in light of where, what the thresholds indicate. I feel like there are a, a number of cells here that, uh, for example, percentage hospital inpatient, uh, that's 85 and 85. It seems to me to fall in the yellow moderate risk. And then there's the, the one yeah. right above. Yeah. 3%? Yes, percent. thank you. And I, my apologies that I was working on this today. So I'm going to fix some of this right here with you. You're right. The data's right. So let me fix my colors. Right. So so you've got like both of the last two weeks in, in yellow. It's just... Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Yep. Thank you for clarifying that. I have um, a comment and some thoughts and a, just a follow-up question, Paul. Um, I was writing things down as you were talking, so I am apologize if I misunderstood something. Um, when you spoke with UMass and you talked about their rate of transmission um, being mostly in the community and not in the school setting, do, do we have an idea of what proportion of the students are doing in-person learning there versus remote? Yeah, it's a good question, Tara, because I was talking to him about uh, when they're coming back, you know, in, in February. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I meant to ask that. How many students are? I think it's a small percentage, right? I'm sure maybe somebody else on this call. He was quite clear because, and I can get to this a bit when I talk more about the testing. He's like, yeah, he's like, we were surprised. We've had zero cases of in-school transmission. It's all people, you know, as we've seen in apartments, inappropriately partying, things like that. But he said zero cases. Basically, he was concluding that their safety precautions, the distancing, the masking is working. It's when you take those safety precautions away that they've seen transmission. Will you be following up with him? Could you get just a little bit more information sure. if you yeah. wouldn't mind? Just just to get an idea. So that way when he when these, you know, when they the statements are made, we just at least have an idea of the data behind what he's what he's talking about. Um and then um I, you know, I, I did have a conversation with Annie after our last school committee meeting, and I do apologize. The past two weeks have been a little chaotic, and I didn't get to do as much um, looking into kind of just um, resources and available information and recommendations out there as I would have liked to. Um, but the one thing that I would say is I, I, 
right now, given where numbers are in Hadley and in the county and in the state, I, I wouldn't recommend we make any changes right now. But I do think it's important to recognize that, you know, from March to July to now, we have learned a lot more information about the virus, about how to manage and mitigate risk, um, and um, what's important to know for transmission and what's not. And I, again, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we change our metrics right now, but I do think it's important that we are reviewing them regularly to make sure that we are um, still following the most up-to-date recommendations that are out there. And I, I understand what the CDC has, and I, I still stand that going with um, the Harvard Global Health Institute is a very reputable source to be looking at, but I'm, I'm curious, and I, I kind of sort of started dappling last night a little bit, just to see if there's any changes in recommendation, if they have changed their, um, um, metrics in regards to what their scales are at. Did they change their thresholds at all? Um, are they making recommendation changes in that? Um, I think there's a lot of information out there by public um, health experts um, and epidemiologists that we could really look into. And I, I think we should look into it. I just don't think it's something that we should. We took a lot of time to really think about and come up with these metrics and a lot of time and effort was placed. And I, I do think they deserve a review to ensure that we're still being appropriate. I just, I wanna make sure that if we do that, we're taking as much time um, as, as needed um, to ensure that if we make a change that it's the smartest and most appropriate change that we can move forward without increasing our risk. So um, one thing we had tapped into too that I, I, I think would be good of us too is if if Emma's still willing to kind of um, you know in addition to our own research kind of tap into her and you know kind of keep on top of trends like this past Thursday Hadley is much worse than the week prior or whatnot and we did talk with her at our last meeting like where are the um, cases falling and Heather had touched on how Emma had said you know there are no um, cases that are just you know isolated here or there and it's really it's just spread consistently and the age group she had said before was 30s to 40s I think um you know that were most impacted at the time of that last school committee meeting so kind of just checking in with her getting her thoughts getting um information on her of what she is seeing um with her available resources um and just tapping into her thoughts in general like you know, here's what we found for information from, you know, recommendations that may have changed. What are your thoughts on it? And I, I would be happy to talk with her again if everybody's willing to have me do that and just kind of start to dapple around with it. And again, I don't, I don't think it's something we should just change right now, but I do think it deserves a, a thorough review to ensure that we are still providing the safest, um, the safest and the safest method with, you know, allowing as much in-person learning for our students as we can. Yeah, thank you, Tara and, and Paul for your comments. I mean, I have, um, I would welcome, you know, your coordination with uh, Emma or others from the Board of Health. And I, I agree that I don't think that now is the time to necessarily change the metrics, but I but I also agree um, where, you know, Paul, yes, we we may be being very conservative with this and we did that last summer. And so here we are now. And I think Tara, to your point, it, you know, just re-examining well, have any of the systems that we looked to uh, for input also uh, changed given how far we've come and the education that has happened. I'm also really curious too that how we might be able to tie in when Paul I think talks next about um, testing and how we might be able to use that to our advantage um, as really a mitigation strategy as we move forward and think about 
you know, the high school having a little bit more movement in the next phases or whatnot. I'm curious how we can tie that in. Okay. Um, I'm also interested in uh, whether we've seen, I mean, vaccination is, uh, is happening, probably not at the pace that we'd like um, uh, across the country, but have we, um, have we seen that coming faster? You know, uh, what do we know about vaccination and how, how likely is it that that will be something that uh, in this academic year protects our school? We may not. I'll have just, yeah, I'll I'll just add. I I think having as much information as possible can can help us. I agree. I don't know that we need to change metrics or kind of you know rewrite what we're what we're using to to say yes or no in terms of reopening the schools. But you know when I when I look at this CDC data, it does it does offer more information, right? We we, we did the three metrics. We stayed hard and true to those metrics. I think they worked, um, but I also think, you know, to the point that was made earlier, we know more. There's more information. We we understand this a little bit better. And if there's a way for us to um, to to have more information in our hands before we make these decisions, I think I think it's important to do so. And and again, looking at the data from last week, you know, was one of those kind of interesting moments where one one data point was below the threshold, one was above. And, and I think this information here, Annie, that you provided is good to kind of, you know, at least provide more information, not only for us, but for the community to better understand kind of the trends that are happening, not just week to week, but over the course of two, three weeks so that we have a better better sense of, um, you know, hopefully where the data is headed, but also, um, you know, to make that decision, we, we have more at our fingertips. I will uh, work on keeping this up to date and make sure my color coding is right. So thank you for that, Humera, but I'll uh, work on keeping that up to date. And just in response to vaccines, I don't have specific information for you. Although based on the governor's conversation today, I don't think there's anything to indicate that the Commonwealth is, we can assume the Commonwealth is on track. And so uh, in group one already started getting vaccinated, those are healthcare workers. I know Tara's familiar with that in her workplace, people are getting vaccinated. So that's already uh, been rolling out. I would say, I would imagine it's been rolling out relatively successfully. And I say that because they're moving on to group two. So group two includes people with comorbidities, underlying conditions and essential workers. Within the essential worker group, the first group of essential workers are law enforcement, firefighters, first responders, paramedics and EMTs they will begin getting vaccinated next Monday. So they're setting up the logistics for that. Those appointments are, uh, they're, they're getting scheduled as we speak. And the next group, unless they change something on the essential workers list would be uh, educators K through 12. And educators includes not just classroom teachers, but all people that work uh, in, in public education or in schools, I should say. I don't think it's limited to public education. So. Um, that's very promising. Let's hope that everything goes smoothly for our first responders. We want them healthy and safe and also uh, because we're on the next wave. As far as children being vaccinated, it's my understanding that um, children weren't uh, included in clinical trials, right? And so I'm not certain that, um, I don't even know that the vaccines have been approved for children at this point. So I don't, I don't think we should be expecting or looking to children to be vaccinated at any point this spring. I would imagine that, um, I would also assume that even if there was an indication um, that they determined that it was safe uh, for younger people, I, I think it would be, we could expect that uh, many parents would choose to wait given the fact that children weren't in the original clinical trials. But for, for the adults that work in schools, I'm hopeful that in short order, our vaccines will be available for us. So I believe just to add on to that, that um, currently with the two vaccines that are on the market, Pfizer is approved for 16 and older and Moderna is approved for 18 and older. So mm -hmm. that does qualify some 16 and 17 year olds depending on what vaccine is being um, um, 
given out, but I think that that's at, you know, that it's, it's at the discretion of really the state and the um, drug companies, which vaccine is being, being provided and what you have stock of and supply of. Um, and the, the only other thing that I just wanted to add to my statement, just given the way that Hadley numbers are, and I know we had talked about this, um, when we were looking at our metrics and looking at Hadley a little bit more subjectively and kind of um, deciding kind of an overall picture based on what we know for Hadley data, it might, I, I, I don't wanna place any unrealistic um, requests on anybody, but I would just be curious based on where the numbers came back last week. And again, I would be happy to reach out and try to find an answer and kind of where do the demographics fall for the numbers for last week, but just kind of looking and if we see a, a, a large rate of increase this week in Hadley numbers, again, um, having even a very brief conversation with the Department of Health would just be a good idea, just so that, again, we can get an idea, do we need to be worried about any type of transmission towards the school based on the demographics for Hadley for this week, if there's a great increase? No, that's a good question. What is startling to me, I know we're not following Hadley specific numbers, but in two weeks we doubled from 24 to 48. That is that is striking to me. I'm curious what we're gonna see on, on, on Thursday and also the following Thursday, especially in light of Christmas and, and New Year's and what we know were, you know, big travel days. Um, so that's worthy of note, I think. All right, are we ready to move to Paul's topic, um, additional information about testing at this point? I think so, I just want an underscore for families. So on Thursday evening, unless there's a delay in the data being um, released, Thursday evening or Friday morning, you will receive an email regarding what will happen next week, which instructional model will be in effect next week. And that'll be based on, on the data that we receive on Thursday night. And it will be, um, again, it's the two, we, the school committee, just so people hear correctly, the school committee did not change any of its metrics this evening, did not change the thresholds, are having a discussion about what makes sense and when and how we may review what makes sense, but nothing was changed this evening. I just wanna make sure that any faculty, staff, or parents that um, are listening to this meeting are clear about that. I, um, before we move on from this topic, I, I was debating whether or not to say anything about this, but in light of the fact that vaccines were approved for 16, 17, and 18 year olds, I think if we had to uh, like advocate for something, I, I would advocate the position that we, that we try, um, that we ask for, that the governor and his colleagues be aware that we thought that was important. And one of the most striking things that I've seen is that um, the, the, um, the long-term effects of COVID on young people and their heart capacity in particular, it, as it relates to athletes, has been something that's been documented and written about. And we have so many athletes in our uh, system. They're going on probably to play for college. Um, I would want to try to ensure that our students were safe. And so um, if we had to take a position, I, I would advocate for taking the position that we um, are able to provide our, um, our oldest children with a vaccine. Uh, we may have no ability to influence that, but uh, but if we don't put it out there, then you know we most certainly won't see any uh, benefit from um, that next wave. Okay, thanks, Yamara. Paul, do you want to talk about um, the testing? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it came to me a few weeks ago, and I've talked to Annie a few times about this. 
So I don't know if you all remember, early on in the summer, I spoke to a guy named Jeff Hescock at UMass. He's the executive director. I think it's um, Environmental Health and Safety and Emergency Management. He's heading up their testing regime. Really nice guy. Uh, he's been very cooperative. And they worked, earlier this summer, they were getting all their testing done through the Broad Institute. So they're testing you know, on-campus students, people that go on campus twice a week. 25 bucks a pop, it's cost prohibitive. Um, but then they, uh, things have evolved, right? They have the public testing center. I don't know if folks have used it. We've used it a bunch of times. You set an appointment, you go, if you're asymptomatic, you get a free test, you hear back basically the next day. Works like a charm, it takes like 10, 15 minutes, but you have to go online and register. They're gonna do that to the end of January. And then uh, when students come back, they'll do it sort of reduced hours, just once a week until March. But I got thinking as like, you know, we've been saying vaccine obviously is going to get us out of this, but what's the best next best thing we can do right now outside of the safety protocols and masking and such is testing. So I called them up the other day after talking to Annie and said, is there something we can figure out about how to test our folks, staff, students, in some sort of regular basis to give us comfort so that we can get our kids back in school. And uh, they are turning to not not only doing using the Broad Institute in Cambridge, but they're gonna start doing their own testing on site. So they've set up their own labs. A lot of schools have done this around the country, right? Uh, it's the U University of Illinois model that they've modeled and, and their brother works at Notre Dame, they're doing that now. So they do all their testing in situ. So he said, he didn't make any promises. Uh, I said, you know, Annie, correct me if I'm wrong. I said, I thought about maybe 600 people, including all students, all staff. If everybody, you know, if we could figure out a way whether we did it you know, some sort of testing regime, pooled testing, whether we followed the phase model that Hopkins is doing where people get tested when the week they're in, or we do something more aggressive and we figure out how to test people consistently enough so that we can get all of our kids in all the time. And he had a great response. He went to the possible. He didn't say no. He said, well, let me talk to my folks. It was last week, so most of his team were out. So I'm going to talk to him again this week. And again, no promises, but that I don't think we're going to solve this. Frankly, I'm never going to agree with you all on the parameters. You're never going to agree with me. Um, and even if we change the parameters from three to 5%, we're still basically only not getting all of our kids back in. We're still stuck with the cohorting issue in uh, Hopkins. And April, as much as you know, I, I love the model that you, you, as creative as you've been, you know, the recent report I read said the hybrid model is, makes, the, makes parents the least satisfied out of any model, right? And so, this is this is our best option, but it's it's a it's the worst of our, our horrible options right now. So, can we figure out a way to test? So that's my plan: is to figure out maybe we could talk with him if he's still open after he talks to his team. Let's figure out a way that we could do some testing. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. They're the experts. Sit down and can we do testing? Whether it's once a week, whether it's twice a week, whether it's pooled, whether it's targeted group, give us comfort so that we can get our kids back in. I think the benefit here too is uh, with the new uh, bill that was passed. Uh, Annie, you've been saying we are potentially going to have some resources. Uh, That's correct. So the the rough estimate is four times initial CARES funding, which would be roughly two hundred thousand um, dollars that districts could use for COVID specific expenses. So we don't have the exact figure, but that's the how we've been told that how it's been recommended that we estimate what we could anticipate. And maybe we do one type of uh, testing regime until all the teachers and administrators can get uh, vaccinated, which is hopefully in the next couple of months. Maybe we, we do it to the end of the year. Um, but so I just want to let you know, I'm having those conversations with UMass, if anybody's interested. Um, nothing's set this week. Um, Jeff's, it's, it's on Jeff's plate to get back to me. But that to me would be the next, that would be the most hopeful thing is if we could figure out a way to get our <clears throat> kids tested twice a week or pool testing twice a week, I would argue they should be back in school. And just like UMass is, where they've had 188,000 tests, 539 cases, zero cases, you know, in school transmission with their testing, I would strongly argue we put our kids back in and, and test, you know, twice a week. I know there's a lot of conversation to happen between now and then and conversations with the, the teachers. Um, but I think that's, that's my ultimate goal. That's Thank, you, Brian. Thank you for talking with them. Really appreciate you reaching out to UMass and continuing yeah. that discussion with them. 
Sure, Sorry, I'll just give a shout out that there, um, again, no promises, but he's been really wonderful, just being very cooperative and thoughtful. Uh, I was just gonna say that's very promising. I mean, we, we identified early on that if we, right. and we even signed a, a resolution to, this, to the state. Um, so really um, smart that you reached out to UMass, um, especially as they're developing this capacity in-house right. and they're probably looking at a lull in their capacity um, so why not? It's income um, and it helps them on, you know, on ramp to greater numbers. It makes a lot of operational sense for them to do so. So I would, if we could get a testing regimen of like twice a week and students and teachers alike were, um, were able, we were able to ensure that there wasn't spread and we could nip it in the bud when we knew that there, you know, that, that would, um, be very smart. Yeah, thanks. Hopefully, I mean, I think the game changers are they have increased capacity and suddenly now potentially we have funds. I know we're not committing all those funds to this, but um, any any sense of when those dollars might be available? If they do, assuming that four times the 50,000 becomes available? I don't have any uh, information right now, but I anticipate I may on Wednesday morning. So um, when I have that information, I'll okay. certainly update the committee. Awesome. I have a question, Paul. Um, what kind of testing are they doing? Yeah, well, they're doing the swab testing. So it's not the rapid test, right? It's and it takes 24 to 36 hours, right? So it's the PCR based, I'm assuming you probably know more about this than I do. I would, yeah, that's what I'm curious about. And I would just I, I, I really like the idea. And I really am very interested in learning more um, about how we can make this feasible in our district, because I do think it's an extra level of, again, mitigation and comfort and safety um, for moving forward, even if it's something where no matter what it is, I just think it's a great thing to have in place. Um, I'm curious what time what kind of test they're doing, because I know previously we had talked about or um, Annie had brought up and it was something that I think, I think was pretty unfeasible, um, but doing something like serology testing, um, which would be looking at um, antibodies. So somebody who's been right. exposed to COVID, which would be different than the PCR test. And so then from there kind of understanding um, what is appropriate testing. So I would be curious, like what, at, if at UMass they're doing this testing, what have they found for necessary testing? I would be cautious to say, well, we should test our students twice a week. Like, do we need to test them that much? Is there, mm -hmm. what is the frequency that they need to do it? What is appropriate? Um, and taking a sample size of the students versus looking at testing staff or, you know, if transmission is really um, not as likely in the younger population, is it sufficient enough to just test the staff at the elementary school? Mm -hmm. But then with the older kids um, who are more likely to contract the virus, should we include them in that? Maybe it looks different at both schools. I'm just, you know, like a lot of things to, to think about as we start learning more about it. Yeah. Very interested to hear more. Yeah, those are all the good questions, Sarah. So if this goes further, I'll definitely pull you in. I mean, I think, and then Annie, you'd sent that thing out about, was it Wellesley that does the pool testing? You know, so if cost be, does become an issue, maybe we look at that. Um, yes. I yeah. think it is, Sarah. I'm pretty sure it is PCR tests. Um, Probably. I'm Which is great, to be honest. Like, I don't think that that's invaluable at all, to be honest. I can tell you just from, again, my limited experience at the hospital that I'm at, which is just a small hospital, although we're part of a much larger network um, with Mass General and Brigham, we are being provided asymptomatic testing. So I can tell you that um, I, I go in every week and I get tested. It's If it's the PCR test, you go in and you do a nasal swab. It's, it's very, very easy. It's not like... Um, when you get the people may think it's you know concerning for some of their kids the flu um the flu test where they stick that way far up and it's very uncomfortable this is it's not it's just into the base of the nares it's a few quick swabs it does come back very quickly it's very easy and it does provide a lot of reassurance especially if you're getting tested very regularly to at least know that you're moving forward and there always are going to be false negatives, but when you're getting tested repeatedly, week after week after week, you start to become a little bit more confident in your results that you're not getting week after week after week of a false negative test. So 
um, yeah, if, if it does start to develop in any way and I can be of any assistance or be pulled in, I, I, I have a lot of questions. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. I mean, so one of the other things Jeff and I talked about was just the logistics, right? If we were testing 600 people, say we did everybody for at least some period, having somebody stationed on site doing that testing so that we're not all going to UMass, obviously. And, and so those kinds of things to us to reduce the cost where they're just simply processing it. And uh, so that might mean we need to increase our staff assistance to be able to process that. But I think there's lots of options. I don't know, Andy, if you have any thoughts on this. We chatted a bit about it. I share the school committee's enthusiasm about this. Uh, one of the reasons that I brought that idea, which at the time uh, was a bit cost prohibitive and not really practical in terms of implementation. But I do agree anything that we can learn about testing, every single possible strategy that we can use to increase the confidence of the community, of faculty, of staff, parents and families um, that students and staff are safe in school or as safe as they can be. I'm all for any of it. So thank you so much, uh, Paul, for taking the lead on this. Thank you others, uh, Tara and others who've offered to be helpful. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Just make sure you're not helpful three at a time. Two at a time, you can be helpful. <laughs> Just not three at a time. Six feet apart, helpful. No quorums. Sorry. No quorums. Oh, I see. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Paul, Paul, quick question. Um, I, I don't know if the conversation went this far, but did you get um, did you get any sense of if they were kind of okay to do this and, and the funds were available, how quickly the turnaround would be? Like how quickly we could start doing this? No, I didn't, Ethan. I think those, I was hoping for conversations this week. And, you know, yeah. again, so he, he said most of his team was out last week and he was going to touch base with them and they were trying to brainstorm. So I think if anybody could figure it out, I have a lot of faith that he, he has the right attitude, but I, you know, he knows it's right away. And the benefit of doing it now is before, this is before the UMass students get back. So let's figure right. it out in January. Yeah. I mean, it might be the stars align, right? We have the funds potentially available. They, they now have the resources. They're, as Humera said, the capacity is a little low, low this month before the students. Let's get it going. I have a quick question, Annie, just real quick before we move off topic. Um, as far as the funding goes and the additional COVID um, funding, as far as PPE and cleaning supplies and what we need for the rest of the school year, are we in a good place? I know we haven't really talked about what we have for supplies or how often, like I know Paul did a lot of work on, um, you know, filters. Do we need, do we have enough to change those out as regularly yeah. as recommended, PPE? We use, yes. Uh, so a few things have happened. We used uh, CARES funding to buy replacement filters. So we have those uh, ready and scheduled to put those in. So we'll replace filters in our air filters. We also received a number of additional high powered air filters. Now I can't remember how many units off the top of my head. I wanna say we received 26 units, additional units. So um, we were able to distribute those in some spaces that perhaps they were larger or spaces that the configuration was of the space, uh, we determined that we would add an additional air purifier uh, in the room. So we had purchased replacement filters. We were um, we didn't have to pay for it. that came from a grant 26 additional uh, air purifiers. Um, we do have sufficient funds for PPE and supplies for the, for the remainder of the year because also our public uh, the town and our public safety officers also got funding through cares for uh, PPE and for supplies. So we are in very good shape with all of that. Excellent. Great, thank you. Well, look forward to hearing um, how that goes, Paul, in terms of subsequent discussions. Yeah, I'll keep you in the loop. Thanks, thanks for the good, good thoughts. And Tara, I'll, I'll definitely be in touch if it progresses. Thanks. Okay, Annie, um, next topic, Hopkins Academy principal appointment. Yes, this is a high point of the night for me, my friends. So just so the public understands, um, the 
by law, the school committee hires, appoints a superintendent. Other administrators in the district are appointed by the superintendent. I know that normally there's often pretty exhaustive and involved searches for heads of districts and heads of school, but I am thrilled to inform all of you this evening that I will be appointing Ms. Camuso as the principal of Hopkins Academy. And the reasons I'm going to give you are do not uh, sufficiently capture why I believe this is an excellent appointment, but I will share a few of the reasons why I believe that Ms. Camuso is an excellent uh, candidate and an excellent principal candidate for Hopkins Academy. Ms. Camuso has worked in Hadley Public Schools. This is her 13th year working in the district. She was a teacher in the district for 12 years. She did many noteworthy things as a teacher. Most recently, she and Ms. Roberts developed and taught the first co-taught course at Hopkins Academy last year. They actually developed the curriculum for that course. It was uh, war and literature or war literature. Perhaps it wasn't an and there. Ms. Camuso also developed the first specialized reading course. She has a certificate of advanced graduate studies in uh, reading. And she taught the first specialized reading course for students at Hopkins Academy in the general curriculum. That's really a big deal. We often focus on teaching reading at the elementary level. And then if a student isn't a fluent reader by the time they're in high school, and if they're, they don't have an IEP, um, they're often just kind of left to struggle. Most secondary schools don't have a lot of specialized reading support. So Ms. Camuso developed that course and taught that course. Um, she's an extremely effective educator. You folks have seen that when I've shared data on student outcomes, and it goes beyond just standardized test data. She was a part-time curriculum director for us while still teaching and being the head teacher at Hopkins Academy last year. She was a member, has been a member of the Hadley Education Association leadership. And that's important to me because she understands what it takes to have effective relationships between labor and administration. She's been the English department chair for many years. I feel like since I've been here and probably before, so at least six years. Um, she has been a faculty class advisor, the newspaper advisor, the advisor for the peer mentor program with Mr. Breland. Um, she helped our students who were interested in leading a gender equity task force. She was kind of the adult behind the, adult behind the children that did that extremely important work. Uh, she did very impressive work on our educator evaluation committee. I don't know if you folks remember when I first started in the district, we were selected to be part of uh, one of many districts across the Commonwealth to work on um, identifying best practices in the implementation of the new educator evaluation system. And she continues to mentor teachers around educator evaluation. And she also provides um, optional support sessions for teachers to better understand the educator evaluation framework. She, it, since, uh, I also wanna say that she's currently a doctoral candidate, that's a big deal. She recently passed her comprehensive examination. So I was fortunate enough to listen to that. And she is researching the intersection of community housing policies and practices and school segregation. Very timely topic and an interesting topic and how these things intersect. Ms. Camuso was kind enough to accept a challenging position. I know that, I have been a high school principal. It's a challenging position in the best of times and she accepted it in a very challenging time. And you folks have seen how she consistently seeks out feedback from the community, faculty, staff, and students. She communicates effectively and consistently. Um, she even does Facebook, thank goodness. Someone does, <laughs> because I still, I, I am not, I, I do not know how to do a town hall. Um, and uh, she's, you folks have also seen how much time and effort she puts into planning and researching and making recommendations for every single phase that we're planning for. Um, she and Ms. Dowd, the principal of Hadley Elementary School have been working together to support faculty and staff um, and also to work with the community to figure out how we can advance our priorities of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And just today, they put together a really 
um, remarkable chart that kind of lays out what are some key activities that we could do and when will we do them and what do we expect the impact of those activities to be and the outcome and, and why are we proceeding with that. So for all of those reasons and many, many more, I'm happy to announce that uh, I will be appointing Ms. Camuso to be the principal of Hopkins Academy. And that was the best thing I did all day. So that's that. Well, congratulations, Ms. Camuso, yeah. and, and thank you. <laughs> and um, yeah, we. I personally, I just wanna thank you for your leadership uh, throughout um, what has not been a, you know, a year that any of us had anticipated, but um, the work that you do, uh, it's clear that you care a lot about what you do. Um, you're good at what you do and um, your support of everyone around you is greatly appreciated because um, as you step up to rise to challenges and give your all, you bring others along with you. Um, who you're modeling that for them. So we really do appreciate that and all that you do. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate all those kind words from everybody. And I'm really happy to be staying at Hopkins and in this community. Uh, it has been a very strange year and I'm looking forward to a hopefully more normal year next year. Um, maybe we can, you know, keep moving forward with all the great ideas that you guys mentioned and that'll help us to get there. So thank you again, I'm very excited. Congrats. And let's say on that note, Principal Kamito, why don't you update us on phase three? <laughs> We're gonna reward you with a, uh, <laughs> a presentation. How about <laughs> you show us some charts? <laughs> nice. Well, I, I won't actually show any charts tonight, but I did already send a folder to you guys of some, some different charts to take a look at. I will start just by mentioning phase three very quickly. So I don't have a huge update. I did work on a transition plan. I did share that with the immediate reentry team. Uh, everyone, of course, was on break previously. So that timeline is a little bit complicated, but I shared it, got feedback from them. And then I shared it with the leadership team today. They'll be taking a look at that. And then I'll be sharing it with the whole faculty on Monday. When I was talking with Dr. McKenzie, one of the things that I was hoping to get a little bit clearer on from you guys tonight is if you do want to formally approve exactly what that transition looks like, then that would likely mean needing to come back next week at the meeting on the 11th, which I know you have as tentative, primarily because I need to be able to share all that information with families for them to know if they're going to move forward and for the staff to also know what that's going to look like. Um, if you're okay giving me specific things that you want to have in there and then having us continue to move forward and implement that, I can always share that at the later date in January. I'm just a little bit more nervous about waiting for that formal approval at the end of January. Um, in terms of, in general, what it's maybe going to look like is looking at introducing students over time in a staggered way, and then trying to introduce some type of an assembly that would help to go over protocols and do something that might be akin to a team building um, to give the kids something. And potentially that would look like the youngest students coming in earliest and the oldest students coming in latest. But again, before I sort of reveal all of those specifics to you. I do want to make sure that the staff have a chance to look at that in case they see something in there and they say, you know, this isn't going to work for A, B, and C. So I am wondering kind of where you guys are at with that phase three transition piece. Um, well, I'm of the mind that, uh, you know, this is not my area of expertise. I'm going to trust your judgment in terms of the particular nuts and bolts of this transition. I like the idea of a transition. Um, I don't know that it needs to be as long as a week. Uh, I think that's kind of what we were talking about, you know, earlier in one of our meetings about if it's a full week, are folks going to even want to be part of that? So, uh, you know, I'm in support of whatever transition the, you all feel is best in order to get phase three underway safely um, and under the, you know, the correct protocol and cohort models. So I, um, 
I haven't changed my stance from last time. And I feel like with, again, I didn't do as much looking as I'd like to, but the one thing that consistently came up when I started looking again was cohorts and recommendations for cohorts and limit mixing in cohorts when possible. And when you look on the current CDC guidance for schools reopening, they say cohorts. Um, when Annie presented um, the data this morning or earlier in the meeting, I was really happy to know our current numbers too, um, because if I wrote them down correct, um, we have 60 students in person out of 258 at Hopkins and 198 remote. Mm -hmm. So that number, I have to imagine is almost gonna flip flop. And that is a huge percentage of students coming into the building when we previously had a very small percentage. Um, and one of the things that we've been really, really careful about through this entire process is not changing more than one, um, more than one factor at a time, really looking at, at one change at a time. And so I still, I, I still feel pretty strongly that um, we need to ensure that if we're bringing um, what I'm anticipating a large number of students back into the high school, which I think is great, we need to make sure that bringing them in is not going to be jeopardizing safety in any way, which is why I had said more than a two to three day window that it should really look like a transition period of a week so that way we can ensure that anything that we're doing along the way is not jeopardizing any safety. And I, I do feel strongly we've come so far with limited transmission. I, I, I wouldn't want to see us throw too much caution to the wind. And I'm not implying that you're haphazardly moving forward April at all. Um, I just would want to ensure that we're still able to ensure that as we move forward, we're still being safe. And I understand that the first, you know, transition for them is going to be that small first period if it looks similar to what you've presented before. Um, but again, that number of students that's in person now versus what we're going to get and then even mixing for that first period, I just still think that that week transition is just important to ensure that we're still being as safe as we can. Yeah, I think that's, sorry, go ahead, Paul. I was just going to ask you, could you, could you remind me, it's been a while, what, what transition are you imagining right now? And how does that juxtapose with a terrorist proposing? Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll give you more details about what I imagined. And I guess in the end, if you guys like it and the staff hate it, then I'll just, I'll just come back to you with, with that information and say it's a no-go on that end, which is fine. Um, they haven't committed to this yet, but essentially taking in, um, you know, those concerns, which are valid and it's, you know, quite frankly, why phase two exists. That's the whole intent behind phase two is that they're in the building not moving. Unfortunately, phase two is not appealing to a lot of students and uh, the majority, if not all of them that have chosen to stay home or came in and went remote again were because they don't like the cohort model and they don't wanna sit there. Um, and I think that was you know, the concern that Paul brought up is how do we get them to, to stay in there because they've opted not to. So I looked at something that was an attempt at being a compromise, which is essentially five days where students come in, or might be six days, where they come in over time. Yeah, it's six, because there's six grades. And so each grade comes in each day, seventh, then seventh and eighth, seventh through nine, seventh through 10, seven to 11, seven to 12. And so that also helps our oldest students who are least interested in coming in for the cohort model, that they would only have to be there for a day or two. Um, within that model. And so they would be there and they would practice all of the protocols and then they would be dismissed at noon. And then they wouldn't start moving until after they had completed that six day period. So that's a piece of what we're looking at in terms of the transition based on your feedback from last time. I'm sorry, I think I'm confused. Um, are you, I just, I just wanna understand and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't get it. Um, are you saying that over like a six day period, you're gonna increase by one grade level each day? Is yeah. that what you're saying? 
Yep. Okay, so then within a week's time, we're still going to have a flip flop in in numbers, right? So we're still going to have, and so are you suggesting in this that it would be um, so like if seventh grade came in, they would come in and have a one day orientation or a two day orientation, and then the following day they would start their transition, going from. And I apologize, I'm not good with no, the they schedule. Would all they would all remain in the cohort for the whole week. So that would mean that seventh graders would be in that cohort model the longest because they came in first. Okay. April, quick question. Is that something that's going to be required? Uh, as much as we can require anything, yes. Okay. But the um, challenge is, you know, that in general, students can opt to stay remote. So we might want them to be there and we might want them to be in this phase, you know, that the staff were really clear too, that they liked the idea of the cohort model and the school being full and being used to that. Unfortunately, that's not something that we can necessarily force students to do. They have the option of attending school remotely and they choose that option instead. So we're trying to, to find that compromise between those totally. And I would say also that once the staff have reviewed this and something is settled on, it also will come down to, just like with the flu vaccines, um, we really are going to appeal to the community's sense of collective responsibility that even if it means it isn't the optimal schedule, it isn't the schedule we would want, a week feels like a long time or a couple of days, or if I'm a student, I think, well, I could just be at home. I could be at home and I'll just wait when the classes change. What we'll, our goal will be to educate people to say, this is, um, we're, we're asking you to do this. If for no other reason, it will make your teachers feel more comfortable. And that's certainly reason enough. So we'll appeal to people um, taking action that may not be about their personal preference or comfort, but is about the collective good. And I have every faith that when presented with information like that, that the majority of people in Hadley will do what's necessary to, um, to show up for each other. Yeah. And, and I'll just say, April, I'm, I, I like it. I like the plan. Um, I think you have obviously taken into account what, what concerns we had last time. And I think, I think I'm, I'm willing to kind of back you on that plan. So if I understand what you're looking for right now from us is um, whether or not we approve for you to move forward with whatever plan is created now, or if you'd like us to bring it, if you, if we'd like you to bring it back to the committee, am I, yeah. am I right? Yeah, last time we met, you wanted me to come back for a formal approval of the transition. That transition hasn't been finalized yet. Um, and so if you do want to formally approve that and see the final product before moving forward with it, then we just probably need to do that on the 11th because I would be concerned about waiting until January 25th to make that final decision. So I'm of the mindset, um, I, I, it's not my purview to figure out, um, you know, classes and all those absolutely beautiful charts and graphs that you have and figuring out classrooms and how to move and how to get kids there and you know all the logistics behind it it's it's not it's not something i'm interested in i do i do trust you in that anything though that is potentially considered a health or safety concern and this i do kids coming back into the school in a, in a large number is something that i think as a school committee um we've been very careful to review and take careful consideration. And I do find it part of our responsibility to ensure that we're still being responsible. Again, I'm not implying that you're not being responsible, but ultimately, you know, I, I do feel a sense of responsibility to ensure that whatever happening is, is in the best interest of the students, the staff and the community. Um, so again, the only part that I am still stuck on is really, I do, I would like to hear the final plan um, after it's reviewed with staff, because I don't know, maybe, um, maybe, maybe something else will be brought to light after you discuss it further in the next week that it might change a little bit. 
And I do still feel that sense of responsibility to look at it and go, yeah, okay, I think we're okay with that because we've done that thus far, as far as the rest of our reopening plans. We've, you know, again, I appreciate the administration. They've put so many long and hard hours into creating that document. Um, and, you know, it was kind of our responsibility to go through that document tooth and nail and make sure that you know, provide any recommendations or change or making sure that the metrics that we put in place are the safest. And so just that, again, because of the number of students, I, I personally would like to see what the end all is and review it before it's put in place rather than just saying, yes, whatever's decided in the next week, I'm good with. That's, that's my personal. So I, I know... Oh, go ahead, Jamara. Okay. Um, I mentioned this last time we talked about this plan, and I think you all looked at me strange, and I've been thinking a lot about it since. Uh, we require students to um, complete certain requirements uh, in order to uh, graduate. Uh, we require them to have good academic standing in order to play uh, play athletics. We require them. Uh, to uh, call the schools and, and give uh, advance uh, notice and plan to bring them back into cohorts. Um, but some, for some reason, we're reluctant to require them to be in a cohort model for a certain period of time, whatever that, that right magic number is, I'm, I'm not even, be that as it may. I think it's well within our right to make such determination and it provides a little bit of a um, logistical um, tracking challenge, um, but we have that ability. We have that ability to uh, say, if you want this, then you have to do this. And I, I just don't understand uh, why, why we wouldn't do that. It's still very unclear to me why we wouldn't do that. I, I can respond a little bit to that. So the only, uh, personally, it's not about a, a reluctance. As I said, I think it's uh, completely logical. If you're asking honestly, I'm not sure of the enforceability of the consequence. I'm certainly happy to ask the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, but I don't think that we can assume that we can make an if-then statement that um, we can then enforce. What's the then? If you don't do this, then you can't come into school. And perhaps that's enforceable. I just don't want to say to this school committee, just nod my head and say, of course, that's enforceable. I don't know that it is, but I'm happy to find out. Right. I think the then is you stay remote. You have been remote all along. Remote has been working for, you know, working well enough. Um, and if you are unable to do this, then you are not able to come in person. So I just don't know if that is enforceable, but I can certainly ask the department. Right, and um, isn't that what like making policy is about? And um, I have, I'll ask, right. I, I just don't know the answer to it. That's the, that's the point, but I will certainly find out. I'll be honest, Mayor. I have no appetite for that. I think that's the wrong way to handle the parents. I think it's, you know, that it will come across very, in a very difficult fashion for a lot of people. I think we'll get very negative reactions. That's not, I think Annie's appeal to people's uh, duty here to say that this, you know, we need to figure this out is, is the better approach. I think we'd get better response. I think by forcing it, people will focus on that and some will push just to, just to push and we'll get a negative reaction. I go to the, or what? So you're going to say, if you don't come in this week, you can't come in the rest of the year. I don't, I don't see how that's acceptable. I don't, I mean, you, I don't think that there's legal. We have a legal obligation to, to provide and if somebody says it's safe to go back to school and we're allowing them and you said no, just because you didn't come this this one week, it seems like a stretch. But more than the le legal validity of it, I just I wouldn't want to uh, handle our other colleagues and, and parents like that. It's a very black and white yeah, scenario. So. It, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't be able to come to school. They would have the remote option and they would need to satisfy something that would assure that they are able to uh, uh, follow the guidelines. I, I just don't think that we are thinking creatively enough about how to um, 
about how to do something like this. And I don't think it has to be heavy handed, Paul. I agree that heavy handed would not work well, but I do think that we could, um, we could pretty easily ensure um, that students had satisfied a certain set of responsibilities in order to be phased in. I think that as judged by the, the flu requirement, we could see what responsibility actually like yielded. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust that in light of, um, in, in light of our stakes being pretty high. Well, I guess that's the issue, right, Humera? What is the problem we're trying to solve? It, it, it seems like a logistical question. And Tara, this is how I'm interpreting you, is that we're going to make a big shift potentially, assuming kids suddenly all decide to come into Hopkins. Have we figured out well enough logistically how to handle that? And so I hear April had originally said, well, give us two to three days, we'll figure it out. At April, you seem to have come back with a compromise. Now give us a staggered approach. We'll phase it in over six days. Um, yes, there is some pain to the seventh graders, less pain to the 12th graders, but to be honest, maybe they can handle it, right? You know, based on maybe your conversations, that seems like your compromise. I'm thinking that within those 12 days, we could figure out this logistical challenge, right? And so if, if we can figure that out in six <laughs> days, then this all becomes a moot point, right? I mean, that, that's the problem we're trying to solve is how to logistically handle an influx of a large number of students and cohort them safely or or uh, have them move through classes safely. And if April thinks she can do it in three days, now she can do it in six days, and the teachers all agree with that, I'm pretty supportive of that. I have a question, and I, I feel bad, April. You can tell me you don't wanna talk about it anymore, because I know that, again, this is something that you wanted to, to talk with your staff about first. Um, so you can tell me, I prefer not to, but, um, you know, when you talked before, you the, the staggered approach to moving would mean you'd start with moving the first period with the seventh and eighth graders. And then the next week, the ninth through 12th graders would move so that every other week, right, there would be movement, right? So then in your staggered approach for starting up the kids, the seventh grade would be in for a week before they had any movement and the eighth grade would be in for just about, <coughs> excuse me, just about a week without any movement. So then you say the 12th graders come in at day six, right? So then they're coming in the following Monday, they'd be in that entire week without any movement, right? Because that would be the movement of the seventh and eighth graders the second week. Do you follow me? Am I making sense? Yep. So effectively in your solution here, you kind of are getting at what I was getting at. And I, I had to take a minute to kind of wrap my head around it because I, it, it's kind of complicated to be honest, but effectively what you're doing is you're providing the seventh and eighth graders about a week with no movement in school. And then the following week they move. And then by bringing in the 11th and 12th graders either at the end of the first week in phase three or Monday, I'm hoping at the, at the latest, then you would provide them with five days in school without any movement, and then they would move the following week, correct? Yes, the, the only thing to remember, just so that things are out in the open, is that they would be cohorted if they chose to come in. So in the plan, we did give students the option in their off week where they're not moving to stay home. So if they chose to stay home, which I would guess a good majority of them will choose to stay home, they they won't be cohorted for that week. They'll be home and then they'll return the following week. <coughs> Some of them will be there just like they have previously, um, but not all of them, I would imagine, will be there. So for instance, if the 12th graders came in and we're saying day one of week two, the 12th graders came in, they'd have the option to just come in for that day and then be home for the rest of the week. For the week where they're not moving? Yeah, week two. Um, oh, the day where they come in, like that first day back? Yeah, like if you do that approach where it's like that six day like cascade coming in, right? So I'm just saying six day based on if that's how it's decided. So then, you yeah. know, the second Monday in phase three would be when the, wait. 
I'd have to look the right. calendar because we did it at certain <coughs> dates as to where that fell. I'm not sure I can answer that specifically um, based on where that falls. That again is probably the type of thing that someone on the staff would bring up and then we would decide how we wanted to resolve that. Like, would they stay? Let's say the sixth day was a Wednesday because of where we started it. Do they stay the rest of the week or do we start moving that next day? Um, so that's one of those finer points that we haven't worked out yet because it's not so even as starting on a Friday and going through necessarily. And part of that, of course, depends on when we even move to make a recommendation to move to phase three, which we obviously haven't done yet. Right. So I guess I still stay on the, if the question is still whether or not we would approve now, or if we want to see whatever plan is kind of that finalized plan. I, I, again, for safety purposes along the way of what we've looked at thus far and what we've been paying attention to thus far, I, I think that it's still our, our, I feel responsible to review the final plan before just signing off on a plan that's still not, not finite. And again, the only aspect is really how to bring that many kids into the school. I, I fully trust, you know, literally every other aspect of the plan. I just, I would feel more comfortable for safety purposes, understanding how we're bringing that many kids back into the school to make sure we're safe. So it sounds like the time to do that would be next Monday. The 11th. So we're, still, we're still slated to move to phase three, January 19th, right? No, no, no earlier uh, than, so. No, it, what we had discussed was, um, remember we said we hit the pause button. The reason that we extended it out to January 19th was because we hit that pause button because we were seeing, we weren't in a place where we were changing our instructional model. We didn't, we hadn't crossed those thresholds, but we were watching things go up, the orange go up, go up. So we hit pause. So if that caused us to hit pause, we said, we want to see, we want, first of all, the data to be such that students are back to phase two, we're back in. And then that for a minimum of two data reports, we see things trending <coughs> back downward, um, was what we had talked about. So hopefully the goal is that people, we saw a bump after Thanksgiving, I guess I forever live in hope. I mean, there is a lot, there are a lot of things that the community can do, but we know this. Those mitigation strategies that we talk about in schools, we can use them in the community. So hopefully that people do what they need to do to slow the spread. And when we see that the spread is slowing, then we can move to this, this next place. This isn't an, an issue about what's happening in schools. It's an issue about community behavior. But so we're looking at two weeks of a downward trend or mm -hmm. below our metrics. Before we, we need to get back, so get out of the red and then two weeks down. So if the next two weeks are lower or below the red, then that would qualify. Right, so we're back and then we look for two weeks down. <laughs> so is that three weeks or is that two weeks? So this Thursday, the data had us back in, right? Got us back in. Then we want to be physically present in the building for two weeks worth of data. So I guess it's two okay. weeks. Okay. Yeah. Did you get what you needed, April? I think so. I think that means we're coming back on the 11th for a quick meeting um, to sort of try to finalize that which should, um, I can get it to you. Uh, you're probably not gonna see it before the meeting though, because mm -hmm. I meet with faculty on the 11th. So you'll probably see it that night. That's fine. And just focusing on that transition, right? Bringing kids yeah. back in that ramp mm -hmm. up plan over that time frame. Okay. Your plan still includes everybody six feet apart. Yes. Yep. yep, and we were in the library today measuring to make sure that the desks could fit because the plan relies pretty heavily on that space. Uh, and tomorrow I have a chatting with Camusa where I'm going to talk about phase three. I had some good questions from parents. They, they don't have access to all the documents I 
had presented with. So they also can't see all of the room changes, which they don't necessarily need. But I'll try to clarify some of those points as well so that they know how exactly that'll work. Um, and that's part of the reason of only moving half the kids at one time is that we only have so many spaces that can hold students six feet apart. So that is all set to continue moving forward and using the new light desks that we bought in the gym because the gym will serve half of it as a classroom and then we'll have to move those desks out for basketball. So um, we are putting the light ones in there that will be easy to move and and Mr. Mish and I will get that done. Okay, if we're good with phase three, I can do the, the survey mm -hmm. results quickly. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. So I sent you a folder of a bunch of surveys that I broke down by grade. Originally, the survey was not sent out by grade to students, but the leadership team asked me to break it down by grade. They found that to be more helpful in thinking about what certain students were experiencing, and I have to agree with that. The student survey that we sent out had a response of 110 students, and then I sent out a very similar staff survey, asked them the same questions. 16 staff members responded to that survey. I won't go through all of the specifics. I know you guys have that, and if members of the community are interested in any specific questions, they can feel free to follow up with me as well. It's a lot of information. In general, though, students did essentially have some conflicts around whether or not the workload was excessive. Some students said that they were doing really well and the workload is fine. Others said that it was um, some, especially seniors, talked about feeling as if they never leave school and school is just all day from beginning to end. So there were some different answers around that and a little bit around the schedule, although for the most part, the schedule was found to be effective. If you remember, we made some changes with the mask breaks and the passing time and those in particular are really working for students. Most of the students felt comfortable with technology, which is good because they need to be using the technology and there have been some bumps along the way in teaching some basics around, uh, you know, adding an attachment and saving certain documents. So that's really good. They also feel as if they're not often late. That may or may not always be accurate. Uh, however, teachers are communicating with parents and we did add in a new call every day. So similar to if someone's absent unexcused, if a student is tardy unexcused, parents now get that phone call. And so that can help um, to trigger a kind of check-in as well and make sure that everything's on track around that. The more concerning data that we had was around students' mental health and motivation, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And in terms of what they wanted to see in phase three, unanimously all students mentioned that they wanted to see different things around safety. So different grade levels mentioned different items, but things like passing in the hallway safely. Right, if you're a student, you remember being in a hallway with 30 middle schoolers running at you. So they, they wanna make sure that those spaces feel safe, which is totally valid. Um, some mentioned not wanting to return until there was a vaccine. So there were some comments around that. And then they also mentioned that they wanted face-to-face -face instruction that was key and that they wanted movement. They wanted to move from class to class and that they didn't wanna sit there. So all students talked about those things. Uh, staff members too also talked about wanting to see their students and interact with them. So both students and staff talked about wanting to essentially see their peers. Some students also wanna see their teachers, which is always nice, but a lot of them really missed social interactions. Some mentioned sports, some mentioned PE. Um, so again, that movement piece and, um, and participating in athletics. And then the, the other piece with the students that I shared, which wasn't a part of the survey, but was data that we've been looking at, we pulled the quarter one Fs and we compared them to the last two years. From last year to this year, we did see a 127% increase in the number of failing students. And in terms of the number of Fs, we saw an increase of 418%. That is certainly a lot. It's something that I, I can tell you anecdotally when Annie first asked me, I said, yeah, I think it's worse. And I think students are failing multiple classes from all of the meetings that I run and attend. But looking at that actual data when we pulled it, it was even more than really I think I realized. And this is kind of what I'm doing all day right now is working with these students and families who are struggling. So it is a really big increase, which of course is concerning, and it very much so is both more students failing and then the students who 
are failing and, and might have failed one course normally, failed that last year, are now maybe failing five or six or seven. And so that's certainly challenging. Remote learning is not working for those students. In terms of the staff, some of them do feel pressures from workload, as you could imagine. Um, however, they do really like the schedule and they feel like students are starting to really understand all of the expectations and the parameters around remote learning. So that's really positive feedback from them. They also still feel fairly motivated, which is great. I know motivation was challenging in the spring and that was of course before we had a handle on most of this. So it was different, different times. Um, but they also have some concerns about their own mental health as well. In terms of mental health around students, um, Ethan had asked a couple of questions that I wanted to, to answer here around that. Um, and he had noted that there was a couple high percentages, right? Overall, we're looking at a little more than half of students who are reporting that their mental health is not very good and a higher number in terms of a lack of motivation. And so those are really big concerns that we have. They're things that we have been talking about. Um, I mean, again, anecdotally, I, I sit in child study meetings and we set up other parent teacher meetings. And these are the conversations that we're always having. We know that mental health and motivation are going to impact students' academics. So we obviously see those things connecting with one another. As a result of those things, the leadership team, which is the head teacher, middle school team leader, and department chairs have talked about that. So we talked about this in December, um, and that was as a result both of the survey when I had initially shared the results, and also uh, the student council, some of the students on student council had brought up some concerns as well with the advisors and they had talked about that in a meeting. So we talked about those things together and we continue to, to try to figure out what can teachers do within their classrooms and then what can we do as a school as much as within our abilities. Unfortunately, a part of what we're seeing is a result of being in a pandemic um, I, you know, I agree that bringing students back to school is going to help, but there's always going to be a portion of their life that isn't quite normal this year. And, you know, that is what it is. And it's hard for us as adults. And I imagine much harder for teenagers to, to try to be okay with that and understand that. And when we have families who are having those challenges, we try to reassure them that it's normal and it's what people are experiencing and it's okay. So we are trying to continue as Annie has always cited to focus on students and families well-being first, so their emotional and physical safety first. We've done a lot of counseling referrals for students and helped families to try to get together with some resources. Our counselors are putting together a session for students around anxiety and stress to help work with them around that. Um, and then we're also, again, working with departments to try to think about the assessments that they're giving, creating time and spaces to work on some of that relationship building. So I know the history department in particular had a conversation about wanting to make sure they have some of that time in their class to connect with one another and to just talk about like, how was your week and what's going on with you and making sure that they're having some of that time. We are working on trying to plan some form of a spirit week. It might not be exactly when it normally is. It might be in March instead but doing some work around that. Um, I meet with the counselors weekly to talk about some of our students who are struggling in addition to our uh, child study meetings, which we have one for every grade level each month, seven through 12. And at those meetings, we use the district's problem solving process to identify relevant interventions to support those students. And those interventions can be a variety of different things. We're trying to think about other things that we can do, other things that we can offer our students that might be remote extra clubs or things of that nature. Of course, it's hard because staff are already working so hard to ask them to do a little bit more, um, but we are looking at that. And of course, I was happy uh, to hear that you guys continue to support extracurriculars. I think that that is a wonderful way to try and address some of these issues. And I'm very supportive of students returning to face-to-face -face learning to also address that. Again, and, and part of what I'm doing this year, even more so than usually as a teacher, is working with these students and teachers and families who are struggling most. So I'm surrounded by that constantly, and I, I know that it is a concern and that the pandemic and remote learning 
are very challenging for a large majority of our students. So, you know, teachers are doing what they can and we're doing what we can. And I'm also always open to suggestions of other things that we can do or other resources that people might have, um, but it's certainly a concern. And I know it's a national concern, you know, around those impacts. So that's kind of the, as quick as I could summary of the information that we have. And I'm happy to try and answer any other questions. And if I can't answer it now, it's always get you an answer afterwards as well. Thank you, April. I really appreciate the information that you shared. And I also really appreciate you putting it in the context of this is a national phenomenon. We are going through a pandemic. Students are, are feeling the effects as are the adults all around, teachers and non-teachers. You know, non um, interestingly, and maybe you've seen this as part of the, the dissertation work that you've been doing, um, the community members who have been meeting to talk about racism and uh, racism, you know, in general, but also just in ge how it plays out in the schools. Um, there's a lot that is written about um, connection between educators and students, like real human connection. Um, and it doesn't happen a lot with students of color and students of other cultural backgrounds. Um, but even just removing the race piece out of this, that is what everyone is feeling is that lack of connection. When you have connection, you can bring out the best in a student's um, work. You can really, you can, you know, you, you know all of this, but mm -hmm. for those who, who don't, um, it, I just wanna, underscore what you just said about the human connection piece. And, and just, you know, I've got three Google Classrooms going on in, in my house and I can see that the, the educators that do that well, my, my learners at home really respond well to that. Have a favorite teacher, have a, have, like really invest the time into learning when they may not otherwise. And so, I would, I'd love to see um, teachers who are doing that well. And, you know, of course, not one more thing, but also teachers feel great about it when that connection happens. It's a, it's a mutual, mutually beneficial thing. Um, it makes, it makes it joyful to teach. So it, it makes it a little less depressing. Um, and it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't take a whole lot. So Teachers sharing with one another, that might be a way. Of course, we have you know Hopkins teachers meeting separately and Hadley Elementary School teachers meeting separately, but maybe there's a summit um, whereby you know, on Zoom and breakout rooms, they're sharing best practices. Maybe it's a professional development opportunity. Um, there are many educators out there that have best practices on how to achieve that. And it doesn't take a lot of time. You can build a ritual in as part of every one of your classes or activities. Anyways, some ideas that come to mind and I would love to see more on this in the future. Even I agree, I agree, Kamara. Also at Hadley Elementary School as well. To, to your point, it's not just a Hopkins, you know, that connection is so important. We've been so lucky to have so many kids back at Hadley Elementary School. And that's some of the biggest feedback that I've gotten from my teachers is the ability to be able to connect even wearing masks. It was so much more valuable to have the students back in person versus the remote learning. It's easier to make those connections um, and in a time where it's very difficult for not only families, but students as well to make connections, to have opportunities outside of school. It just speaks to the importance of having having the kids in when we possibly can. Um, and so um, I, thank you for saying that. Absolutely. And I would, I would just also want to remind us that it's not impossible to do remotely. It's, no, not at all. It's very possible. It's been done, you know, for years and we we're new at this as a district. So how might we learn faster um, in light of what is being done out there in the world. So learning those new strategies and, um, and sharing them with, with one another, I would say that that's important. And also not when we're not in a pandemic. Right. That we, this is one thing that we hold on to. One last thing, 
um, a lot of schools that are doing this well are doing social emotional checks. Um, mm -hmm. And so that might not be the teacher, maybe it's someone else, maybe it's a, a, a CARES funded, you know, half time, I don't know. I, I, I know that when we put our mind to being creative and how we achieve these things, we can imagine the ways in which that student and that family are, are being connected with um, in a more personalized way. So I, I'd love to hear more about that in the future too. Yeah, I really appreciate the attention to the mental health um, topic. I was encouraged in seeing the survey results and thinking about how much phase three and the vision of moving forward is aligned with what we're hearing folks say that they want. So I appreciated seeing that, but surfacing, you know, the, the F grades and just the prevalence of that, um, you know, I do think, and we've been asked to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, grading policies in terms of how that will work within whether there is lenience, whether there is, you know, um, it, how much wiggle room we have with this, especially uh, to your note about um, seniors, you know, kids in grade 12 who are uh, not meeting graduation requirements in this era. So um, I look forward to hearing more about that, but I really do um, commend the surfacing of the mental health issues and the attention that will is being paid and, and will continue to be paid to that. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say, I agree with that, April. I appreciate you paying attention. I, I find these data appalling. 52% of our 12th graders have poor or extremely poor mental health, half, more than half. So half of your household tells you they have poor, extremely poor mental health. 45% of 10th graders, poor, extremely poor. One fifth of ninth and, and 11th graders, poor or extremely poor. I, and I, I, I fundamentally don't think remote will ever equal. I think there's a fundamental disconnect from the humanity associated with seeing people face to face that at least in my generation, I don't think remote will equal that. And I know having my own students at home, it's not the same, regardless of how good the teachers are. Um, and I think there's more the school committee can do. I will say again, these data should shock you. You should be concerned that half of our 12th graders, and they had a good representation. They had more, they had like 70% of their 65% of their class response. <coughs> poor or extremely poor mental health. We could do better. We can do more. We can let them in and be safe. Follow CDC, follow DESE. That's, I, think it, I think you should be appalled and I think we should change. And I think you really need to think on that and not just dismiss this as, oh, this is, you know, it's, this is tough and we need to do better to, you know, help reach out to them. They're telling us what they need and we can give it to them and still be safe and we're not. That's what makes me frustrated. And Paul, I, I agree with you that it's, I, I don't like those numbers at all. Um, but I also know that, um, some of those numbers just reflect the tremendous amount of loss that our kids are all experiencing, some of, some of which has to do with school and some of which has nothing to do with school. Um, there's been a lot of, I'm sorry. I can't parse that out, Heather. You're probably right. I don't know the degree to which, I mean, I don't when either. Said, how do they rectify that? They told us how to rectify that. What's the, one of the most consistent things? Movement, face-to-face -face instruction. But that, that was the pretty consistent response. I, I, I agree. Be better at giving those, them that. I absolutely agree with those priorities. But in thinking about mental health, I can tell you that there could be kids there in person um, who are still experiencing the tremendous amount of loss of events and family and other things that they have not been able to experience. So I, I do want to help. Sure. I'm just saying that there's a lot there that I want to support students with, but we may not be able to answer that. And I just, That's I am right. absolutely appalled by it, but I can't, I can't take the full burden of that because I'm sharing in it, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not right asking there you with, yeah. I'm saying to control what we can control in our school committee. And I think we are doing a disservice because we are not doing all that we can. Flat out, we are not doing all that we can. I strongly disagree with the four other uh, school committee perspectives on this. And these data prove that. 
127% increase in Fs, a 418% increase in the number of Fs, 127% increase in the number of kids failing. Holy cow. We could do better. I have a couple. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead, Tara. Um, a couple of a couple of questions or requests for April, and then um, one point that Humera um, had made me think of. Um, so I I feel like we need to keep looking at this, and so I think that we should complete this if you already don't have it in mind um, at least quarterly so that we can keep track of this to know that any changes and any interventions that we're making are helpful. Um, and I, I, I personally would like to see this information at least quarterly so that we can track and trend it. Um, and in that, I would ask if it's possible to compare our district to the state and then national um, numbers just so that we can get an idea of where we stand in the state and then where we stand nationally. Um, the other question that I had in regards to failing grades, um, because that was something that I had brought up based on a, um, an article that I had found. Um, and so um, I'm curious, just again, I'm not asking you to answer this now, I didn't think of it before now. Um, the number of failing students that you have listed, the, the number that you gave, um, what proportion or percentage of those are on an IEP or having some form of special education or 504 or specialized instruction? Um, and then um, what percent of those kids in both areas? So what percent of those kids um, are remote versus in person that are failing? And then breaking it down further for kids that have specialized instruction, either on IEP 504, however you want to break it down, knowing what percentage of those kids are remote versus in person. I'm just curious to kind of dig into it a little bit more if you're able to without um, you know, giving any identifying factors there. Um, just a little bit more information would be helpful just to get an idea. And I, I think it'd be helpful for you too, to kind of, if, again, I don't expect you to answer that right now, because it's kind of specific. Um, and kind of reporting out on, on that type of information, again, at least quarterly, while we look at that survey, I think it's really important to repeat that. And I do still think that it's <coughs> important to look at something similar. And again, maybe the survey isn't exactly the same at the elementary school. Um, because when we look at this, seventh grade and sixth grade aren't, aren't that different um, when we look at the age groups. And, and so I'd, I'd like to be monitoring that as, as well and making sure that we're tracking that and making sure that whatever um, strategies we have in place, we're able to improve on from survey to survey. And I think it'd be important to ask the same survey so that you can compare that information. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to say real quick um, is when Humera was, was touching on kind of the social emotional awareness of students and looking at the elementary school as well, I don't remember exactly where my head got with this, but I started thinking about how last year and the year before we talked a lot about um, transitions from sixth grade to seventh grade and um, how that might look. And I, I remember the conversation always being, how can we improve a student's experience going from the elementary school to the high school? Because we've always had some feedback that maybe our experience could really be improved upon, both from the parent's perspective and the student's perspective. Um, and so I I, I don't want to lose sight of that right now because that it has a strong potential to look really, really different for kids this year, making it potentially that much more scary to have that transition. So if it's something where we normally have that step up day, can we look into planning even now how that might look in the spring um, for students that are looking at the high school? Because something we always all, always also talk about is retaining students, right? And whether or not they're gonna stay with us um, going from the elementary to the high school. And that's that's a problem prior to COVID. Um, and so this year, I'd, I'd, 
I'd really like to not forget about the fact that we've always wanted to look at that and make sure that we're making it, um, uh, um, you know, a comfortable and not scary, but an exciting transition for those kids. And how do we even do that while we're in the middle of a pandemic for these kids to make sure it's not scary and that it's still exciting and that they still um, have enough excitement about our school that they want to continue on to the high school. So just, just a thought. I don't know how, you know, that would look or work, but I, I can see Jen's wheels spinning. So I think she's probably going to think about like, okay, how can we do some collaboration? I know you and Brian had kind of started it and I, I know you and April have a great relationship and anything we can provide again, we're yeah. always here. There's, there's um, two points. I Well, one, I just want to <laughs> clarify the grading um, aspect. When we look at sixth graders, we don't currently have the same grading system. So our, our grading system is not, at, you know, an A through F, um, but rather we have our standards-based report cards. And so we, we grade differently at, at HES. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and to the second point that you had mentioned, um, doing some transition activities and really making sure that we're not just, we're not having a Hadley Elementary School experience and then a Hopkins Academy experience, but how do we have a Hadley Public Schools experience? And I've been really excited um, that, to be working with April I really enjoyed my experience with Brian, although I've only been in the district under three years. And so unfortunately, half of that, I've been in COVID world as a principal um, and trying to manage my way through um, promoting school choice and having students have authentic experiences in the building and really making connections with each of my students. And so, and and building upon the relationship that I'm currently having with, with um, with April Camuso in trying to think of initiatives and exciting things to retain our students and to make sure that we not only ret retain them, but give them an experience which they'll leave Hadley Public Schools um, and come back years after and really feel like they've been a part of a school community that they're proud of and can go on to college and other experiences and really come back and enrich our, our school community even years after they graduate. And so that I know that's a commitment that we share. Um, and again, last year it was very interrupted. We had already started planning some, some fun things and then March 13th happened. And unfortunately um, our world kind of shifted. Um, but I, I know that we have a strong commitment going forward to make sure that we do retain our students and, and, um, and April Camuso is great with ideas as I, as I am as well. And, we, and we've been communicating very well around our next steps, not just um, the next couple weeks, but the next year and so forth, so on. April, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I mean, I'm happy to talk more about it. I know on the Hopkins end, uh, some of our teachers are very invested in trying to make connections at HES prior to that. They have been the last few years and we've had lots of conversations around that. Traditionally, the peer mentors does a lot of that transition as well. And, um, you know, so we'll check in and see what's gonna happen. They did do some transition pieces, unfortunately, not all students participate. And again, I think, you know, I don't, as, as nicely as I can say it, I think it's, it's hard to describe to people who aren't in it. When students are remote, they don't have to participate if they don't want to. And so, you know, we assign them specific people to reach out to them. We put in intervention after intervention, we assign them peer mentors and they run advisories and if they don't want to respond, all they have to do is not open that email. So it, it is really challenging. And I don't know exactly what we'll do for the seventh grade transition this year, because a lot of what we normally do um, is hard. Even students in clubs aren't participating the way that they normally participate, and they're not completing the things that they normally complete. Mm -hmm. So I'm certainly excited to, to hear some ideas that people have about how we can do that. And I think the transition in general, what this year has shown, our transition years, grade seven and grade nine are having some of the hardest times. Mm -hmm. And in general, seventh grade has a challenging transition, which is usually facilitated by our wonderful seventh grade teachers who have them there in person and the activities that we can do and not having those has been really tricky. So I definitely wanna think about how we can help to make that as smooth as possible because it has been even harder 
and it is always, you know, a bit bumpy as it is. So I'm happy to keep thinking about that. Thank you both. I would say any opportunities for school spirit, April, mm -hmm. um, that, and, and maybe it's um, something that um, you and a small task force of people just think of like, how might we build in those school spirit activities that, um, that, that start in the spring and crescendo and towards the end. I, I think a couple, one, two things come to mind. One is, um, although they will get better at checking email, it's not until like my third one, oldest, is now somewhat regularly checking email. The younger, not so much. So anything, you know, seventh, ninth, I would say avoid email. Uh, and maybe it's just, you know, N equals two right there. So I, other strategies, but the other piece, I. I'll say it before I forget it. The um, we I think it was um, Terry Earl's leadership and a few others who had seniors walking through the hallways in their robes and other mm -hmm. symbolic gestures like that that really were inspiring. And so that can't mm -hmm. happen the same way during the COVID era. But the senior parade was really special. And I think it fell on a Friday afternoon. And I mean, maybe it was, but the way they circled around Hadley Elementary School, and I heard that teachers were falling and seeing their, you know, young ones graduating, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way to like make that inclusive. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I would, I would do some thinking on that. And, and of course, by then, they've already made their choices. So you have to do the stuff leading up to that. Um, yeah, we'll keep thinking about it and keep working on it. Any other questions about any of the, the data? Hey, April, I just have a quick one. Is there any sense, I don't know if you've asked this question yet, of, of who, how many kids are planning on coming back in phase three, if possible? In, in how, how I sent out a survey right before break, so right after we met, mm -hmm. and I don't have a very high response rate. I was going to send out a reminder, but I also sort of want to send it out with that transition plan information. I did too, as I said, I had some parent questions, and I think they're looking for a little more clarification before they respond. So mm -hmm. the, the talk tomorrow will be recorded, and we can post that on the website as well. And I have an optional meeting with students on Friday if they want to attend it to answer some questions. And then I'll, I'll think about whether or not I need another space to answer some questions. But um, I am gathering that, but that's not completed yet. All right, thanks. I'm going to say, April and Jen, thank you for all the hard work that you're doing to collect all these data, just like the school committee has said. And if there are any students who are watching this, uh, you can hear from all the adults here that your distress matters greatly to us. And when we talk about how to execute these plans as safely as possible, it's not because um, we wanna unnecessarily make folks wait. I hope that there are students who listen to these that they hear the thoughtful and rigorous debate among all the adults trying to sort out how we can get back to normal as quickly and as safely as possible. But I just want kids to know that um, we hear you. We hear you. And we hear how hard it is. And um, yeah, we hear you. It'll pass, it will pass. And it's not the same. And also we hear you saying, no matter what we do, you wanna see your friends, I don't blame you. You know what I'm not going to do next year? Say, wow, I think I'll have a Thanksgiving Zoom just for the fun of it. <laughs> I'm not. I want to see people. I want to be with people I love. I want to be in their presence. I want to see my acquaintances. It's going to happen again. We're planning right now to, to try to move us ourselves into the next phase. We feel it's safe to do so, but I just want, if kids are watching, um, we don't collect the data for the sake of just collecting the data. Mm -hmm. It matters. Your frustration and your sadness matters to every single one of us, and we're doing everything that we possibly can to do something about it. Well said. Thanks, Annie. I think with that, we're done with presentation and discussion items. 
I'll move into the school committee reports and discussions, uh, starting with Humera with the collaborative. Any update, Humera? Uh, the only update I have, Heather, is that I'm making my way through all the documents that were most recently shared, including a fiscal year 20 uh, CES comprehensive annual report, uh, an audit, and a um, certificate of approval of their, uh, I think it's their certification of the board of directors. Um, anyways, um, Bill Deal's tenure is ending at the end of this, um, uh, or ended at the end of last year, and there's an interim now in place. Um, there's a search for a new executive director. Uh, aside from that, uh, there's nothing else to report. Thanks, and once we either, uh, if the interim is in place for some time or depending on the search, it would be good to have um, whoever, either the interim or the new appointed executive director uh, as part of our meeting as a, a guest, just to keep that relationship and dialogue open. Uh, I always welcomed when they've come and talked about the services that they offer. It's a great idea. And they really do listen and take into consideration what our current needs are in designing programming that serves the district. So um, it would be great to have them back. I'll look for that opportunity. Great. Um, no updates on negotiations. I know we will start um, those discussions soon. Um, no updates on policy uh, and the fields, Paul. Yeah, just uh, I walked the fields the other day uh, with Steve Sunkowitz. Um, lots of Z's and Y's and consonants in his name, but really uh, he's associated with the local snowmobile group and just a, a thanks to him. I think we've got a good compromise. He and I put out uh, signs to direct the snowmobilers around the new fields. So thank you to him. Uh, shout out to David Phil, the select board too, to helping to facilitate that, that conversation. So I think they're they're very receptive. Obviously they understand they, they don't want snowmobilers going right across the new fields too, and, and but they need to be able to access Cumberland Farms for gas. I think I know that's important to them. So uh, I think this is a good compromise. And just if any snowmobilers listening out there, please follow the signs. I mean, nobody, you know, we can't regulate that, but it, it's important to um, to let that new grass grow. I, I worry about those uh, days where the snow is spotty and there might be snowmobilers still out there. It, you know, that, that grass is still pretty young. The turf is. So thanks again to Steve Sinkovitz for helping set that up. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and finance, Ethan, anything? No updates. No, okay, great. And yeah, I know Annie, you're on top of the um, CARES Act funding, all of that <laughs> in, that may benefit us. All right, our one action item we have for tonight, the approval of the November 20th and the December 7th, 2020 minutes. Any questions, changes, revisions on the minutes? Is there a motion to approve them? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have two meetings coming up January 11th. We will meet, we will review data and we will review um, the transition piece for from phase two to phase three uh, for um, grades seven through 12 from April. We'll meet at 5.30. We are also meeting January 25th. That's our regular meeting. We'll have um, business manager reports then as well. Um, any, any other comments or topics before we adjourn? I would love to make an announcement uh, if I could. So yeah. as you know, community members, a lot of uh, parents um, and, and um, sometimes even students have been meeting um, as part of a book discussion uh, on the topic of racism and how to make our uh, schools and our community more diverse and equitable and inclusive. And um, so we announced in December a winter series, um, a two part series whereby in January people are um, not reading a book, but I, um, selecting from one of, uh, selecting from two movies or two podcast series. Uh, to just sort of have a uh, beginner level discussion about the history of racism um, in uh, North America and the US in particular. Um, and then 
February is um, addressing racism as it relates to education and the and K-12 schools in particular. And so um, the way to find out about that is to go to hadleylearns.com. That's hadleylearns.com. There's a place to sign up. And there's these are excellent video and like they're wonderful movies it's and podcasts. Talk. I would urge you to take in one and join the group. Um, it's Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, there's small breakout session discussions. So in a small group of people who are also learning um, uh, alongside you, no one's an expert. Um, you, you sort of like talk about what you learned and, and what really uh, opened your eyes and, uh, and then come together as a, a larger group and talk about action taking place in the, in the community. So I, I highly urge um, any first timers to join hadleylearns.com. Thank you, Humara. Appreciate that. Anything yeah, else before there. we conclude? All right, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Happy New Year, everyone. We are not going into executive session. We are adjourning, so have a good night. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Bye.